I'm pretty nervous. I actually have to do something first. <laughs> my sister told me that if I, uh, if I started my talk by, by doing that, that I wouldn't be as nervous. And I just realized that she completely tricked me. <laughs> I turn on my computer. This is I something that I made uh, 10 years ago. I go online and my breath catches in my chest. <gasps> I had a gut feeling you would be online now. Is there uh, uh Okay, I can't see it. I can give you advice. I'm great at advice. So I've been uh, interested in internet culture for, for a decade now and uh, something I uh, created I guess uh, a few years ago was a fake real, uh, Roger Ebert Twitter called Real Roger Ebert. And uh, so this is one of my tweets, uh, The Passion of the Christ, very predictable. And uh, I've only tweeted seven times but uh, it ha you know, it's got several, I think a couple thousand followers, probably not anymore, I haven't updated it in a while. But uh, yeah, like I, I noticed one day, or someone sent me uh, this link to Roger Ebert, like the actual <laughs> Roger Ebert's blog, and uh, he says near the bottom of his <laughs> blog post, he's like, the other Roger Eberts on Twitter are not me. Not even real Roger Ebert. <laughs> My immediate goal is to enlist more followers than that imposter. <laughs> and that was like the, the pinnacle of, of uh, I guess, like I hit the pinnacle, like someone actually famous was acknowledging this thing that I was doing, this really dumb thing on the internet. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess that th these things come way before me creating uh, the website I have now. <laughs> This is what I actually came to speak to you today about. I'd like a show of hands to know who brushed their teeth this morning. Okay, okay. So here we have all the people who raised their hand. They're broken into categories. One category being people who actually brushed their teeth. The other category being liars. <laughs> 
of the liars, there's a couple of categories. People <laughs> chewing gum. <laughs> Inconsiderate, gross people. <laughs> and of those people, oh sorry, then there's also the people that didn't raise their hand. And there's a number of reasons, I think, for people not raising their hand. One, they didn't brush their teeth. Two, they're just unwilling to participate even though this is being filmed right now. Because <laughs> they're lazy and embarrassed, or embarrassed, about bad breath. Or armpit stains, they don't want to raise their hand. <laughs> but these are only, you know, a small selection of the possible scenarios for why people either raise their hand or didn't raise their hand. One of them is they could be butlers who brush their teeth, if by their you mean their rich master's teeth. <laughs> people with no arms that <laughs> were able to brush their teeth this morning by moving back and forth in front of a toothbrush taped to the wall, but were unable to <laughs> raise their hand just now. Hostages were also not able to raise their hand. Specifically, people being held hostage by someone that was given a free ticket to Creative Mornings who was initially excited but then stressed having to hit refresh on the website until all of the hostages had a ticket and would only bring them if they agreed not to move. Hostages also, some of them raised their hand who were told they could move their arms after their kidnapper realized it would look suspicious if a whole group of people was not moving. People that aren't hostages but also can't move their arms. Paralyzed people since birth by fear. Snake bite just now. Or people holding two coffees also <laughs> are not hostages but could not move their arms. So keep that in mind when I tell this story. This is a completely true story. Uh, a number of years ago, I was uh, volunteering in an in a orphanage in Mexico. And this is a... Despite this image, this is a true story, we were sitting around a campfire and one of the guys there brought out a glow stick and we broke it just to kind of like, you know, have a rave or whatever and <laughs> we broke it in half by accident and we decided, we're all dumb teenagers, we decided we would cover ourselves with the, with the juice, with the glow stick juice. So. <laughs> We're in the and this is not near the beach, this is like in the mountains. Like, I don't know, this is in Ensenada, Mexico. We're in like a mountainy area. We're covered in glow stick juice. We're glowing. We're like, what should we do? So we decide we're going to run down the highway. So, and the highway is this winding road, dangerous. And the nearest thing, the nearest landmark is a memorial for where people have died, I guess, <laughs> crashing on this, this road. It's not safe. So we're like, what better place to hang out? So we decide we're all gonna run single file line towards this <laughs> memorial. And so there's no lights. It's literally just us, we're glowing. And in the distance around three bends of the road, I can see headlights coming and it's a car and it disappears and we're still running and then it appears and it goes around and we're still running and we're converging on this memorial where like people have died. And when we get there, the car comes around the corner and it spins out of control, I guess having seen us, because we're all glowing and we're in a line and we're running towards the car. And it crashes through the guardrail and crashes into the mountain. If it had gone the other way, it would have gone off a cliff and th there would have been more added to the memorial. But he crashes into the, into the wall and, you know, so we're all Canadians, we're, we're like, we should go help, you know, let's go help. <laughs> but we forget we're still glowing. <laughs> so we all go around the car, we're like, just getting up to it, almost surrounding it. And the car just goes in reverse and squeals and comes out and it's the front of the car is destroyed. And the guy just takes off. And he, I, I'm sure, well, well, I have, so my next series, this is probably the thoughts that are going through the guy's mind after he drives away from what's just happened in a car that's completely destroyed on the, at the front. And so he thinks to himself, are you in the middle of nowhere? See? <laughs> I don't know why I wrote him talking to himself in English and then him answering himself in Spanish. And then I was worried that you wouldn't know if that was a typo, so I put in brackets, yes. Were the people you saw glowing? Yes. Did they try to abduct you? Yes, because he thinks we tried to abduct them. 
Is there any chance they were just dumb, bored teenagers from another country who poured glow stick juice all over themselves and were running along the road when they saw you crash? They were actually trying to help you. No. Okay, you definitely saw aliens. So, when people tell me that they believe in aliens, I don't discount that there's aliens, but I think a lot of people have encountered dumb teenagers somewhere. Uh, okay, so none of these stories are directly related, but hopefully by the end of it, something miraculous happens and it all makes sense. These are two images uh, by two different artists that I encountered roughly two years apart uh, after I started Boom. Uh, the image on the left, uh, I encountered first on like Tumblr and I thought it was a painting and as you can see there's two owls and they have uh, a bird and, and then yeah, two years later I came across this other, I had posted the first artist's work and I came across the second and it looked like almost identical aside from the fact that it's the mirror image. And so I was kind of, uh, this is kind of my thought process, like the guy, uh, thought process like the guy in the, in the crashed car. So I'm thinking, you know, is this a collaboration between the artists? So I look up the information and no. Does either artist credit the other? No. Do they live in the same country? No. Any major differences in the images aside from one image being flipped horizontally and looking slightly more photoshoppy? No. Is there a ch chance that these are dumb 14 years from another country who bore gold No, okay, these are definitely aliens. But what I did was, I actually, sorry, that was a stupid joke. I emailed both of them and I said, this is really awkward, but I just need to know like what's going on. I don't want to say one artist is copying the other, but it really looks like one of you has taken the other person's image and flipped it. And it, I, I don't know of any other possibility other than like, I, I was under the impression that the first person was making these dioramas and shooting them. And I'm not sure what the second artist was doing. And so I was like, I don't want to accuse anyone, but I, you know, I'm just really interested. So they, they emailed me back and what it turns out is both of them, one of them lived in, in uh, Amsterdam, one of them lived in Germany. They both had gone to the same Museum of Natural History and they both had stood in the exact same spot in the museum and taken the same photo and then one of the girls just happened to flip it because she liked how it looked. So they had no idea about each other's work. They weren't copying each other. They weren't stealing work. It was just something that happens probably every day in front of the Eiffel Tower but it just seemed different because it was in the context of art. So this is uh, a great a movie poster for a great movie, uh, The Rock. And uh, <laughs> I remember when this movie came out, I was I think in grade eight, and everybody wanted to see it. And we were so excited, and my friend Mark actually went ahead and saw it without me. And he couldn't stop talking about it. I was like, I don't want to hear about The Rock. I don't want to hear how cool it is. I don't want to hear anything about it. I want to see the movie. <coughs> so he's like, let me just tell you one part. Let me just tell one scene to you. I was like, okay, you can tell me as long as it doesn't ruin the movie and I can still watch it without knowing anything that happens later on. He's like, okay, so there's this one scene and Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery are in this kind of room and they're shooting at this bad guy. And he's like, I couldn't believe it. The, the bad guy shoots up at the ceiling and this air conditioner unit falls on Nicolas Cage and kills him. <laughs> and, and then I, and I was like, did you just ruin the movie? Like, is, that sounds pretty important. Like, he's, you know, <laughs> he's a main character. He's like, oh, whatever, you should still see the movie. And so I left that conversation really annoyed and I originally had plans to see the movie the next week, and I didn't. I was so mad that it was ruined for me that I didn't <laughs> see the movie. So years go by, I haven't seen The Rock. I, everyone else is like a, a movie that most guys in my, in my uh, age group had seen, and I, I hadn't. So I decide one night, I'm like, oh, I should, you know, I got nothing to do. I should finally watch The Rock. Like it's been several years, four years. And so I remember, I load up the movie, I'm so excited, I start to watch it, and three quarters of the way through the movie, sure enough, there's a scene, and I, can, I 
my heart starts racing because I recognize what the scene is. <laughs> and Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery are in this room and they start shooting at this bad guy. And then there's a wide shot and there's this box in the ceiling and I'm like, oh my god, that's the air conditioner unit. I'm waiting for this thing. And I, I, something weird happens and Sean Connery shoots at the ceiling and the air conditioner unit falls and kills the bad guy. <laughs> and and I, I was confused and I thought, did they use the same trick twice in the movie? <laughs> and then I realized that Mark had lied to me four years ago and I lived for four years thinking that Nicolas Cage had died in this movie. So I, so I made a little timeline of my life, the two possible scenarios. So, this starts off with Mark reveals that Nicolas Cage unexpectedly dies in the rock when an air conditioner unit falls on him. An unbelievable story that no one would ever believe. I believe it. So this is where it breaks off. In, in the one scenario that didn't happen, I'm mad that he ruined the movie, but I go and see it the following week anyways and realize that he was just joking. Nicolas Cage doesn't die. What a funny joke. Haha, ha, Mark, love that guy. <laughs> the other scenario, what actually happened was, I'm mad that he ruined the movie and I don't go see the movie the following week. In fact, I don't see the movie for several years. I live in a reality where Nicolas Cage died in The Rock. Everything feels normal. So back to the other scenario, I meet a girl at a party who has also just seen The Rock. We both loved it. We are made for each other. <laughs> and back to my actual life. I meet a girl at a party who has just seen The Rock. She loved it. I want to keep the conversation going. So I say, wasn't it crazy when Nicolas Cage died? I was shocked, were you? <laughs> In this other scenario, I ask her to marry me and she says yes. She was ugly anyway. <laughs> So time passes and we have kids and in this scenario the closest thing I have to a kid is a website. <laughs> so the last thing that I want to read is uh Hold on one second. Actually, I'm going to leave them off. When I get uh, into that story, my glasses fog up because I'm so excited about it. But uh, uh, this article is from a book called The Conversations by Michael Andaji, a Canadian writer. And he's speaking with um, Walter Murch, who edited uh, the Godfather movies, Apocalypse Now, a lot of amazing films. And uh, actually, he was like one of my idols. I went, uh, I studied film at Emily Carr, and I wanted to be a film editor. And he actually spoke at my graduation. And I remember I was so excited. I was going across the stage and I, I saw him and I realized this is gonna be the only, the closest I ever get to him. So instead of just going and shaking his hand, I, I mean going and shaking the guy's hand who was, I was supposed to shake, I broke off and I walked completely to another area and I just asked him in front of everyone in the chant center. I was like, can I just shake your hand? I'm a huge fan of yours. It was the stupidest thing to do. And, but I knew my girlfriend was filming from the upper deck. So I was going to have this lifelong memory of, you know, stealing my idol's powers by shaking his hand. <laughs> and so I get off the stage and I'm like, oh, let's look at the footage. And she, I'm like, did you get the part where like, I, you know, I shook hands with that guy? And she's like, oh yeah, she thought I meant the other guy. We watched the footage and she filmed me walking across the stage. And then she looked up at like some image of like my work the whole time where I met him and then looked down. So really it's just like an average clip of me walking and there's, no, there's nothing like memorable. Okay, so anyways, this guy's a genius and uh, this is him talking about uh, a theory called negative 20 questions and it's a, a theory by a guy named John Wheeler who's a quantum physicist who uh, invented the term the black hole and uh, this is his theory about how the world works at a quantum level. So does everyone know how regular 20 questions work? Yeah. Okay, so essentially like I could leave, you guys could all decide on an object in the room, I come back and then I ask 20, I, I try and guess the object that everybody here has agreed on in less than 20 questions. 
So, John Wheeler thought up a parlor game that reflects the world, the way the world is constructed at a quantum level. It involves, say, four people, Michael, Anthony, Walter, and Aggie. From the point of view of one of these people, Michael, the game, is being, the game that's being played is normal 20 questions. So Michael leaves the room under the illusion that the other three players are going to look around and collectively decide on the chosen object to be guessed by him, say, an alarm clock. Michael expects that when they've made their decision, they will ask him to come in and try to guess the object in fewer than 20 questions. But in Wheeler's version of the game, when Michael leaves the room, three remaining players don't communicate with one another at all. Instead, one of them silently decides on an object. Then they call Michael back in. So there's a disparity between what Michael believes and what the underlying truth is. No, nobody knows what anyone else is thinking. The game proceeds regardless, which is where the fun comes in. Michael asks Walter, is the object larger than a bread box? Walter, who has picked the alarm clock, says, no. Now Anthony has chosen the sofa, which is bigger than a bread box. And since Michael is going to ask him the next question, Anthony must quickly look around the room and come up with something else, a coffee cup, which is smaller than a bread box. So when Michael asks Anthony, if I emptied out my pockets, could I put their contents in this object? Anthony says, yes. Now Aggie's choice may have been the small pumpkin car for Halloween, which could contain Michael's keys and coins. So when Michael says, is it edible? Aggie says, yes. That's a problem for Walter and Anthony, who have chosen inedible objects. <laughs> now they have to change their selection to something edible, hollow, and smaller than a bread box. So a complex vortex of decision making is set up, a logical but unpredictable chain of ifs and thens. To end successfully, the game must produce, in fewer than 20 questions, an object that satisfies all the logical requirements, smaller than a bread box, edible, hollow, etc. Two things can happen. Success. This vortex can give birth to an answer that will seem to be inevitable in retrospect. Of course, it's the blank. And the game ends with Michael still believing he has just played normal 20 questions. In fact, no one chooses the blank to start with, and Anthony, Walter, and Aggie have been sweating it out doing these hidden mental gymnastics always one step ahead of failure. The other possible result uh, of the game is failure. The game can break down catastrophically. By question 15, let's say, the questions asked have generated logical requirements so complex that nothing in the room can satisfy them. When Michael asks Anthony the 16th question, Michael breaks down and has to confess that he doesn't know, and Michael is finally let in on the secret. The game was negative 20 questions. Wheeler suggests that the nature of perception and reality at the quantum level and perhaps above is somehow similar to this game. So that's kind of, uh, that was the most boring part of my talks. Excuse me, I, I, the, I tried to highlight what I thought was important <laughs> and I started to highlight and then I, I highlighted the whole first paragraph and I was like, man, this is good stuff. And then I highlighted half the page I was like, I might as well just highlight the whole thing so I don't forget when I'm up there. So it was hard to read because I had started blacking out on top of the highlighter later and I was like, forget it. So that was a, a small excuse for that performance of reading that. But uh, so a real life example of this ha thing happening to me was uh, an, an unintentional version. We went, uh, friends of ours, we all went to see this movie, True Grit. And uh, it was a great movie. And it was uh, packed. And it was so packed that there was maybe six of us that tried to see the movie, and three of us had gotten there, and we're like, oh, we'll try to save seats for you. So we went in, and we realized there's no possible way. So we texted them, we said, you know, good luck finding seats, there's no way that we're gonna see it. You know, try to sit somewhere else, and we'll just, we'll meet up after. So they, they texted us like, okay, we got in, whatever, at least letting us know. And we come outside after the movie, and we're all, you know, talking about the movie, and, uh, Someone's like, oh, Jeff Bridges acting, amazing. And someone else was like, yeah, like I never saw the original. I know this is a remake. And we started talking about the remake. And then someone was like, yeah, the girl was so hot in that movie. And I was like, that's kind of weird. She's 15, but whatever. <laughs> and then, then someone started talking about special effects. And I was like, you know, it was a Western in a way. It was like, there's no, not a lot of special effects. And then I realized that they didn't see True Grit. 
they saw Tron. And both movies have Jeff Bridges in them. Both movies are remakes. There was all these similarities, and we literally talked for 20 minutes before I realized that we had not even been in the same theaters. And, and so that, in a way, is the negative, negative 20 questions in a totally unintentional way that I think happens every day, but it happens in, in the scenario where it's successful, and we never know that this other reality even existed. So that's kind of where I want to end my talk today. Thank you. This is the fun part. The scary bit's over. Well, that's not true. This can be really scary. Uh, I'm going to start with a question. Um, one of my favorite questions is about failure, especially as it relates to creative professionals. And I wanted to know if there was ever a, a significant failure in your creative career that you recall and if possible, was it one that related to this notion of assumptions and perceptions and reality and, and that really interesting topic that you shared with us today? Uh, I think my, uh, well, the first part of that is uh, I'm really trying to force myself to have a failure this year. And <laughs> that sounds really cocky, but I, I meant like that I'm actively trying to do stuff where it could easily fail if I don't do something that I've never done before. And uh, it's scary. I, I have a genuine fear of speaking in public. And uh, I think some people say that, and they're actually really good at public speaking. And I wasn't joking when my sister told me to do that really stupid thing, because I was asking her, like, because she TAs, uh, or she used to, at Queens. and. I was just like, you know, what are some tips for speaking? And so I'm saying yes to public speaking gigs only because I am scared to death of them. And I feel like uh, it's the only thing that really interests me right now is to do something that's really scary. And I'm not sure exactly how that relates to the things I talked about today. But uh, one thing that I'll talk about, I guess, is I was interviewed by the province, I guess, a week or maybe a week and a half ago about the talk. And the reporter asked me a lot of questions that weren't in that article that uh, Mark showed. But she wanted to know, you know what I'd be talking about. And I didn't want Mark to think that I hadn't thought about it at all. But I actually thought of way, like a ton of stories. And I was having a hard time narrowing down my talk to only a few. so. I told the reporter I knew exactly what I was talking about. And I told her two things, the fact that I'd be talking about The Rock and uh, aliens. And as a way of forcing myself to have to put those two stories into the, into the talk. So I was almost doing the negative 20 questions thing where I was putting rules for myself into this talk before doing it. And, and this is definitely failed for me before doing this, but I think it's a fun, scary way of working to hem yourself in and then have to come up with a crazy solution that meets all the requirements for the thing that you've set yourself up for. And uh, there's a show called Bored to Death uh, starring Jason Schwartzman. And I remember there was an interview with him where he talked about uh, doing the theme song for the show. And so he's a musician, and they asked him, like, you know, Jason, would you want to do the theme song for our show. And he's like, oh yeah, I'd love to do it. And I guess he slacked off. And they called him and they said, you know, after a couple of months, they're like, we just want to find out how the theme song's going. And he's like, oh, you know, it's great. Like, I, I made this cool little saxophone part and it's going really good. <laughs> and so they hung up and they were satisfied. And then a little while later, they called again. They're like, you know, we just want to check up on the song. You know, what's going on? He's like, oh, I made this really cool, like, detective kind of like baseline and like and then they, they you know so it was a series of all these calls over a long period of time where he was talking about specific things in this song that he wasn't working on and the way the theme song is in the show is him having to remember a series of all these phone calls and making a song that met all these really random requirements uh, yeah so I don't think that answered your question at all but that's what I'll say about that um, I'm getting used to I'm getting used to that as a theme with you. <laughs> Who has a really great question for Jeff? 
Done. We're done. Oh, good. All right, sir. Um, you give your talk today. You go home. You go to sleep. You wake up tomorrow morning, and you're Batman. What do you do? <laughs> uh, I love Batman. That's a that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I think I do more public speaking because even though I'm Batman, I'm still afraid of public speaking. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Mr. Hamada, um, if you were a talking dog right now, what would you tell us? Uh, <laughs> I, when, I, when I gave that uh, answer, uh, I was I was serious because I'd been watching these anim these videos of one of this uh, elephant that could paint, and then someone sent me this uh, video link just like a couple weeks ago that was uh, an elephant that could speak Korean, and it's online if you look for it. And so when that question came, I I genuinely think it would be cool if eventually it would be a horrible talk. It would be maybe. 30 seconds, but to hear what a dog had to say. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I'd probably just say hi a million times, like that Far Side comic where the dogs just say hi a million times. <laughs> this is way harder than doing the talk, actually. Hi, I have a question about your creative process. Sure. So you go through all these different kinds of thinking, and then where does it go from there? Like, when do you build? Do you make something? How do you know which stream to follow? Do you bring numerous things together? How does that help you? Uh, I I I have a journal, and I uh, I try to make voice memos every time. Like, if I'm uh, I think I think my 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 skill set that I'm realizing is the idea part. I'm actually not the best person to execute or actually I can execute an idea or initiate one I actually really like starting new things but I don't like <laughs> maybe it's a commitment issue it's like continuing the thing on for a thousand years it freaks me out so I enjoy just coming up with ideas and I used to think that I enjoyed the whole thing like coming up with an idea making it and then birthing it and then it lives on but now it's more like, I just really enjoy the idea part. So that's what I spend most of my time every day now is writing down ideas and meeting up with people and giving some away and just talking about things. And um, yeah, I'm not treating ideas so precious anymore because I feel like I, I was afraid. As a creative, I think sometimes you're afraid that you're going to give away your best idea and you'll never have another idea. And I think just in the last couple of years, I've been, become like a lot more confident uh, in my ability to come up with a new idea and the type of people that are going to take that idea well, that's all they can do is take an idea and I, so I think like uh, yeah I, I, I've really I guess exercised that part of my brain the, the part that allows me to generate a new idea and uh, I really just get involved with projects now where I meet someone and they provide the other skill set, the, the opposite skill set, to allow me to just do one of them. And I'm not even, I'm really bad at staying on track with a person's question, but I feel like, yeah, I guess it's, it's really for me, like I enjoy the first idea part, and what I'm dealing with now is trying to make more time for my own work to where I actually take it past that part, instead of like journals and journals of ideas to, just doing something to get in the habit of doing the other end, even if they're uh, just a daily ritual of, like right now my ritual is like looking for work, like I've spent five years just looking at a ton of work and writing down ideas, and to over the next year to really create a routine where instead of doing that, maybe I don't post as much on the site, but I'm every day making something just as a way to like train another part of my brain to like learn that part. Uh, hey, uh, we were talking about your website, uh, and until the very end, I realized I was talking about Boom with eight O's. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering why Boom with seven O's. It's probably the I. It's probably the question I get asked the most, and there's no there's no real 
interesting answer. Other than I was interested in graphic design and I thought of the logo first, so the logo required there to be seven. Because there's like, in my mind, it had to be a box that was three by three. So the amount of O's that could fit in there was seven. So I woke up, convinced myself to go downstairs, registered this random URL for no reason, and then I tried to get other ones just for the fun of it, but pretty much like seven and maybe eight were the only ones that were available. And and it just was it just worked out that people had, I guess other people had woken up out of bed and had the same epiphany, but weren't graphic designers and registered three, four, five, six, eight, nine, whatever O's. <laughs> and I happened to be the only graphic designer that woke up out of bed and realized it was perfect that my logo could work for the amount of O's that were available. <laughs> Does anybody else here, I mean, most of us are probably boom.com fans, but does anybody else have the same problem that I have where you, if you want to go to the site, it's like, well, my dude's bookmarked, but if you're first time on a browser and you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like, you, and it's so, it's so easy to like, it's such a terrible, like, URL. Yeah. It's worse, Which is uh, awesome, it's, it's worse at the bank because my business is actually incorporated and, uh, and they hate me at the bank because they actually have to count the O's on my business name every time they handwrite. I don't know why they handwrite the little transaction slips, but the, the, so now some of them I can see them roll their eyes and they're like, yeah, seven O's, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so, but they remember me, so I think it does work to my advantage. Hey, uh, thank you, Jeff, for sharing your stories this morning. Uh, in our little group, we were discussing about um, how your speaking style relates to collaborating or sharing ideas or how kind of ideas are generating, because you seem very relaxed and kind of in a uh, loose state where you're not very, not, you don't have like a thesis and you're trying to hammer it out. You're just like, oh, and this is kind of in the area and this is kind of there. And then like, and uh, it kind of made us think about uh, kind of find direction in our own lives, you know, like how do we, how do we make sense of our lives? And like a lot of times, you don't know, just a series of events and then you kind of like, in hindsight, you kind of draw a line, but when you're kind of in the moment, it just kind of all these kind of spheres of experiences. And so we were thinking, our question is, um, or kind of the field where you can kind of explore is uh, when you decide to become an artist, how did is, where, what was, when you're in the moment, how did, how did you, come up with your decision to pursue what it is you're doing? Uh, yeah, I think, well, I think you kind of said what I would say to you if you had made the end part of the question, then I could have just said everything you said before that as my answer. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think that I literally went to art school. I think some, for some people, school is like a, f a funnel that funnels you to one thing. You get interested. You're kind of looking around, and you're like, oh, I want this. And I, like BCIT, obviously, is like you go for a specific thing and you go on a straight line and that's it. But for me, like art school was every day, like becoming interested in more and more to where it was overwhelming. And the only thing I could come up with was just to learn everything that I was interested in. And really, I'm, what I'm doing now is, is really says a lot about my non committal personality, where I want a website that will allow me to do whatever I want. And it would freak me out if I had to wake up at 7 a.m. every day and do talks and a schedule knowing that that's what I had to do. But I like that this website allows me to sometimes wake up at 7 and do a talk and then tomorrow I'll stay up till 5 a.m. working on the site and then go to sleep and be asleep when you guys are awake or whatever. And it's, it's like it still counts as my job. And I think that that's what I told myself when I was driving down here. It's like I got myself into this position to do public speaking today, and I hate that I made the decision a while ago, but <laughs> it's my job, and I should be really excited that somehow this is part of my job. And so really, what I'm doing now is really a reflection of that, just uh, certain things I don't like in terms of feeling hemmed in to like have to be doing one specific thing. And uh, yeah, the ability to feel like at any moment I could change what it is, and and Boom is more of an umbrella for a bunch of creative projects. It's not just a blog or a website. I'm going to suggest we're, we're five minutes from 
from finishing. I'm going to suggest we leave it there, folks. Um, unless some, do you want to do one more? Do we have time for sure. one more? Do you think you guys are okay with, with that? Let's go way back there, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you hold on? I'll come. Watch me go. It's a quick one. If you could go back and design the movie poster for any movie. Which one would you want to work on? Like a general <laughs> I would choose The Rock, and I would put a giant <laughs> air conditioner at the top of the movie poster. <laughs> Can we end on that note? Yes. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I came all the way out from uh, Surrey today to come out to the event, and uh, it's totally worthwhile just for all the networking opportunities and also just to share ideas and to really get to meet great people such as uh, ben. ben Chan and uh, Stephanie, <laughs> my, my new uh, best friends. <laughs> yeah, this was my uh, first time coming to Creative Mornings, and what I thought was really cool was just seeing uh, a local creative like Jeff Hamada and how ridiculously honest and genuine he is um, in his creativity and it really plays out in his work I find and I think that's really inspirational. Hi I'm Steph, uh, it's also my first time. I thought the breakfast was delicious and I thought Jeff's approach to talking about creativity was creative in itself because it was more a speech about his background, uh, little anecdotes, and it gave you an insight as to uh, how he came to be the person he is today, which I thought to be a lot more interesting than him just talking about, this is what I do every day, which would have been cool too, but this way just felt more um, um, personal, and we got to know him a little bit better, and definitely worth the trip out. Uh, I got up at 4.30 to make the trek in for this, so um, I would do it again in a heartbeat. So thank you very much for putting this on as well.